Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a Fireside Chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe, the host and co-producer of the Fireside Chats with Mistress Joanne Gaddy. Today, I'm at the home of Mr. Roland Jaggard near London, England. And this is a very special interview for me. I am honored and humbled to be here. So without further ado, may I introduce Mr. Roland Jaggard. Hello. So, Mr. Jaggard, or shall I call you Roland? Call Roland. Roland, okay. I, I, from my heart, would like to thank you for welcoming me and the filming people here to your home. You're very kind, and I'm very humbled and very honored to be speaking with you today. Please know that. I do know. Thank you very much. It's, <laughs> it's um, <coughs> slightly nerve-wracking that I'll fulfill your expectations, but I'll do my best. And I appreciate it. You haven't done very many interviews about Operation Spanner, at least not that I'm truly aware. And I'm not aware that you've done an on-camera interview about this before. So why have you agreed to do this with me today? Well, we, we did do one interview at an award ceremony with a German television company, but it didn't last very long and we never actually saw the result. However, um, there were one or two radio interviews but they were more salacious in approach, whereas your one from what I've seen of other interviews is um, more to get to the heart of the matter and understand how people function and how it feels within the gay SM world and what have you to um, tell your story and, and get it across to people. So that's really what I've agreed, um, and it'll also, I hope for me anyway, to sort of draw a line under everything once it's done. I don't intend giving any more interviews. Then I feel especially honoured to be able to speak with you. Oh, you're welcome. Ah, thank you. <laughs> so, take us back. Tell us a little bit about your early life. You're from a small village. Yeah, I was... Um, Brought up in a village about 20 miles or so from where I live now. It was in the middle of the, we lived in the middle of the countryside. <coughs> there was, um, I was adopted. I was the only child uh, of the adopters. Uh, well, they did have another one originally, but um, they never kept him for long. So I was brought up as an only child. Uh, there were no other children my age <laughs> within half a mile at least, so a lot of time was spent playing by yourself and things. Uh, obviously it was better when I went to school, um, but even at school we didn't go to the local village school because it had a headmistress and one mother liked headmasters. Uh. So we went to the next village, which um, was about another six miles or more away, took the bus every day uh, and made friends there, but of course People generally didn't have cars in those days, um, so you didn't get to see your friends out of school hours very often. It was like a special event, so that was the early childhood stuff. Once we got to the secondary school, which for them was around 11 or 12, that was a cycle ride away, so that was much easier. We used to cycle into school and back every day and have friends around quite often for that, from that period. Um, so that was all right. The secondary school was fine for friends and companions and what have you. What was your mother's <laughs> reasoning for a schoolmaster versus a schoolmistress? I think she just wasn't very keen on women, <laughs> <laughs> basically. She, she always got on better chatting with, with blokes. Uh, that said, she because we were a poor family, which we were, she used to do for people, as they said those days, which was basically um, cleaning and housework and stuff. and she. Um, go and earn some extra money doing that but from my point of view actually it turned out rather well because it gave me a sort of feeling for some of the better things in life because all these houses that she worked in they were all the posh ones around the area so I got to see nice furniture nice everything's virtually you know and I enjoyed all that so that was quite good but even then ironically none of them had any children so again there was nobody to play with particularly mm. Mm. You said that that did change, though, the older you got and you were able to make more friends. Did that make you more comfortable at that time? Oh, yes, I was quite happy. The secondary school, I was 
really pretty happy in. I mean, I did like it. It was a lovely school. I enjoyed it. Uh, did well in it. Started sort of midstream. Uh, and as um, time went on, it sounds boastful this, but I got better and better and ended up near the top of the pile and, and getting me qualifications, A-levels and things at the end of it all. So, yeah, I liked the secondary school. And I did keep in touch with a few um, friends for a few years after we left. But, of course, once you get to 18, people split all over the place. And, yeah. and then it became harder again because I knew I was gay and I didn't know how to contact anybody, really. It was, we were still illegal at that time. You told me that from an early age you had a dread of authority figures. Please tell us about that. Well, it, first of all, we used to have um, some of the... Uh, we, I used to go to chapel, which was a sort of C of E, Church of England type oh. thing. It was very low-key, though, I have to say that. But nevertheless, um, <coughs> you could tell that if you like, homosexuals weren't their cup of tea from quite an early age. Uh, they didn't actually use the phrase per se, but you, you certainly got the impression that it was all about family and procreation and all this. Um, and then the other problem was being, at that time I was fostered, which is the sort of precursor to being adopted. Adopted is a legal position where you actually become part of the family, whereas fostered means we put you in here for now. If it works out, you stay. If it doesn't, we move you on. And that used to terrify my mother. So she inadvertently, I feel, passed on a fear of these authority, in inverted commas, figures from the council children's department who would come along every month or so to assess how we were doing. And, I mean, there was one phase when my father went off the rails a bit and she was... You know, really said, oh, you must, don't say anything to these people, we don't want them to know, and this sort of thing. So that's where that started. Um, and then, not too bad, during the school period, it wasn't so bad, it's sort of post-school, I think, once I'd got to uni and beyond and started getting a bit more into the gay world, um, I realised that um, we weren't flavour of the month for quite a lot of authority, the system, police, um, the media things like that. Well, the media I got wind of early when I was younger just by reading some of the um, press, like the News of the World and things. When my mother used to have the people in the News of the World, and even though it was never discussed in the family, you could tell that they weren't keen on us. <laughs> That's where it started, I think. And to be fair, I do think that my case has escalated. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> yeah. But you, you mentioned being fostered. What, what was going on there? Fostered meant that um, I was born in and then put in a children's home. Um, I was taken away from my birth mother at four days. She was described as having melancholia, which in these days would be called depression. Mm -hmm. So they, dis they deemed that um, after four days, presumably, that I shouldn't be with her, which is odd. And then, I, I can't remember any of the rest, I, the outcome of that was that when I was about two years old, um, my mother, as I'll call her, um, took me in, along with father, um, to bring me up with, as I said, another boy, but that other boy one didn't work out for reasons I don't really know because I was too young. Um, so that's what the fostering is, and that's why she was so nervous, because it is the position, and they had the power at any time to take you away again. Oh, you know. okay. um, she was a overprotective, to be fair. Lovely lady, but a bit overprotective. I can see that in retrospect, you know. Um, and then uh, adoption is when you decide, like I decide and they decide that I want to be legally, take the family name and have all the rights of relative, family relatives and things, and then you go to court for that. You get signed in, you get a new birth certificate oh. with their names on it. You know, so that was that's really what that's about. Okay. From an early age, mm. you said that you knew you preferred men. Now, mm. coming from the demographic you've depicted, how did you know this? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I think when you're very young, you don't have any names for anything. You just True. know what you like, and I knew yeah. what I liked, and. Um, 
I mean, at primary school. For, <clears throat> I mean, it's like a lot of these things. The people who are sort of anti-gay always say, oh, well, it's phases and this sort of thing. Yeah. But I knew at a very early age that I much preferred um, being around the boys than the girls. The girls were all right. Um, but at school, you know, you do the sort of show me your, show you mine type of <laughs> stuff that people do when you grow up. And I loved all that. And I, whereas when it was show me your, show you mine, and they haven't got anything to show you, you know, <laughs> I was a bit disappointed. So um, <laughs> I, I always just preferred male company. And I, I liked um, older male company. And the father, my father was fairly much like so often a pretty absent figure a lot of the time. Mm. He wasn't um, demonstrative at all. I mean, it's a generational thing. I'm not holding it against him. But again, my parents were not what you call social beings. So it was a relatively isolated life socially. Um, so all my social life really revolved more around school friends and things rather than uh, adults, where I might have got a sort of different view on things. But I just always knew I preferred mucking about with me mates. <laughs> um, having got told off in school in a couple of lessons, you know, I think that's might be standard for how we grow what, up. What do you mean, what happened? Well, the bad lads always sit in the back of the class. In those days, classes <laughs> used to be all desks in a row mm -hmm. um, facing the teacher who had the blackboard and the desk and he sort of talked at you, or she talked at you. Mm -hmm. You wrote down what they said, if you could keep up. Uh, and then he kept discipline and so on. Um, and the general rule was that you'd sit at the back of the class if you wouldn't muck about a bit. But I thought, well, I'll ride reverse psychology this, so I'll sit right at the front by his desk on the grounds that he'll be paying attention to the people at the back. And then about <laughs> halfway through the lesson, he said, Jagob, will you and this other boy keep your hands above the desk for the rest of the lesson? So um, we did. But there was a bit of shuffling because, believe me, fly buttons are just not as easy as zips. <laughs> <laughs> That's the sort of thing, you know. So it was a little bit of fun. And um, I'm giving my life away here. <laughs> Eventually, you studied engineering in college, and that yeah. led to a career yes. in engineering. Yeah. Please tell us about the uh, work that you were doing. Okay. Well, the, I'll backtrack fractionally. When I was a, a lad, the only two things I ever wanted to be was a doctor or an engineer. Oh, okay. I've actually got a, a book from way back where it says, I want to be, and it's got engineer, because I couldn't spell it, and or doctor. But at the secondary school, where I did my A-levels, I couldn't get on with a chemistry master. Well, if you can't do chemistry, you can forget being a doctor, because you need a chemistry A-level to even to get into the uni. Um, but as for the engineering, I've always been investigating medical devices and taking things to bits since being a very small boy. Sometimes I learned to put them together again, you know, but essentially you could take it all to bits. So that's why I went into engineering. When I'd qualified, um, I worked at what was then Hawker Sidley Dynamics in Hatfield. Uh, it had just been renamed fairly recently from de Havilland Aircraft Company. Oh. And they were well known for quite a lot of pre-war planes, the Comet Racer, um, the de Havilland um, Rapide, mm -hmm. um, and most famously, of course, the Comet, which was doing wonderfully until the window corners cracked yes. and they all fell out the sky, yes. which was a great shame because nobody knew about metal fatigue in those days. Right. So the apprenticeship was done there um, and you go around various departments, but I knew where I wanted to be. I wanted to be in design because one of the things I took was technical drawing at A level because I wanted to design stuff, the sort of, if you like, the more technical side of the thing and nice and clean didn't want to <laughs> get mucky in um, work <laughs> workshops and things. And uh, so that's where I ended up, was in the flying controls department, oh. which for me is the only decent department in the whole factory because uh, it's the most interesting equipment there. So we was involved in design of that. Initially, obviously, as an ex once you're an ex-apprentice, you end up in the department you've chosen, you felt, have you? That's where I ended up. You get simple jobs. Um, but quite quickly you get quite important jobs. So 
like for instance on the Trident aircraft, there were various models of Trident, 1A, 1B, uh, 2, 3B and something. Sorry about that. I mean, memory's rather poor after all these years. It's all right. But essentially one of the mods I quite enjoyed was um, I had to modify the connection points for like a 2B undercarriage to fit into a 3B aircraft and sort of thing. And I was quite enjoying it. And then the boss said, by the way, he said, just remember these legs cost 20 grand each <laughs> if you, um, you know, make a mess. But I didn't, and that was all right. Um, other times there that were quite important, there, were, um, there was a Trident crash at Staines in Middlesex where it crashed uh, soon after takeoff. Yes, I yes. can't remember the year, but it's, it's on par. Early, early 70s, yeah. Uh, and that was because the, um, the droop slaps had been put back in too soon and it stalled and pancaked, essentially. Yeah. At the time that happened, um, the controls that they were concerned with, I was doing mods on, it was on my drawing board. And that was over the weekend of crash, Monday morning when I went in. They whisked all my pictures off the off my board, wow. all the drawings and things, and you had a terrible sinking feeling. You think, God, I hope I didn't kill a hundred and something of people with my mods. But in retrospect, obviously, I didn't. I did see the um, output, the accelerometry outputs from the black box later, and that is quite traumatic because it just goes along. These are G-forces, if you like that way and time in that direction and the g-forces were like this and then suddenly it goes right up and wow. then plummets and stops so that will be you know hitting the ground is the right up and then the stop a second later is of course when it's crashed and finished crashing if you like so that was salutary that was a, a rough time at the factory for everybody concerned i think um, and then after a while it was one of those companies where you didn't really progress much until people died. Uh, um, a bit like the railways used to be where, you know, firemen couldn't really become drivers unless um, a vacancy of death had occurred in some manner. So I thought there's no prospect here, of no future of getting anywhere because I wanted to do more. Um, so I left and went contract. Oh, okay. now, contract, I'm sure people know what that is, you get paid, you don't get um, employed by the company you work for. You're just, if you like, a sort of freelance company. Yes. You get, and you get farmed out to different companies. So I went round a few other companies, um, and eventually I ended up at um, British Aerospace in Stevenage, um, and that was on test systems, which essentially was test equipment, build, design, and manufacture of test equipment for missile systems. Oh. Uh, and that was much more interesting. Than, um, and I remember one day they said, anybody interested in optics? Well, I've done photography since I was about eight, and I like everything scientific. So I said, yes, I've, I've done it. <laughs> right, they sent you on a couple of courses. So they sent me on a couple of courses, and I ended up involved in infrared photography and uh, infrared lenses and stuff, because a lot of the equipment used infrared, especially the stuff attached to helicopters and to mm -hmm. some of the missile systems. So that was interesting. The whole job was really very good. I loved it all. Um, the upshot over a period of years is I got promoted up and up and was a group head by the end with um, a fair number of people working under me. But while they were busy doing, if you like, the routine work that I've been doing previously, I got the more choice future work type of things where you've been given a very rough brief and you'd have to go and... Um, uh -oh possibly start from first principles and go and work out new methods of doing new, it's new work basically, so you're at the forefront of what was coming along rather than picking up from what had already been done. That was jolly good and got, you know, a trip to, trips abroad and um, trips around the country to various army bases and stuff. I enjoyed all of that, it was all wonderful. It all carried on all being pretty wonderful right up until <laughs> the day um, the world fell apart. Which we'll get onto later, I expect. Yes, <laughs> that, that's quite an honour that they would have entrusted you with this new technology and the progress that was going on. Well, because it was <clears throat> the position you were in. You know, mm -hmm. as a group head, you you had to be kept up with what was going on, and of course, it involved other departments more so than the average guys would. But I don't want to overstress it. It was within the 
factory. Uh, it was a fairly regular setup. There were quite a few group heads um, in various departments, but um, I must have done all right because uh, two or three times I was the only one in the department to get pay rise. Oh, they merit oh, pay rises, oh, I mean, oh. you know, so it was doing all right. Uh, was was that work what brought you to Metropolitan London? Uh, well, I, I, by that time I'd left home and moved to the area. Um, that wasn't so much work. Oh yes, well, I suppose it was really, um, because I had work, that was at Hatfield that I moved to um, this area, and um, it was while I was at Hatfield, and I still hadn't really, it was still a relatively um, lonely life in as much as uh, I hadn't met any gay people, not knowingly anyway, uh, which I really wanted to do. And at that time, um, there used to be a magazine called Forum. Looked in there, there was an article uh, about the CHE in the magazine, so I thought I'll contact them, uh, write to them. And uh, actually at that time I was still living at home just. And uh, I thought, well, there was one quite near me where I lived at home. And like a lot of gay people in their early days, you think, oh God, I can't do anything near home. What if I met someone I knew or, you know, a bit traumatic? So I actually chose, there was a group in Hatfield, and I thought, well, I work in Hatfield at that time, so I'll choose that group instead. So that's what happened. I contacted them, and uh, life started then, really, pretty much. But what was the, the CHE? The, well, the C Campaign Homosexual Equality, it was oh, set okay. up just after... Um, Homosexuality was legalised in this country, in England and Wales. Okay. And it was a campaigning group, and the idea for them was to try and get the gay needs into the public eye more. Because a lot of people in, like, if you like, the authority and the law and so on, had the attitude, well, you're legal now, so what's your problem? Now you can all shut up and go away. But we didn't all want to shut up and go away. Um, because of the way the laws were couched in those days, even with being legal, made it still very difficult for people to get in touch. So that was really, it was to help gay people become part of proper society, if you like. That was their main aims, I think. You, you mentioned that although it had become legal in England and Wales, wasn't there a rule, a law, about... Uh, two gay people being in a house at the same time. Yes. What was that? What that was, this is what made everything so difficult. If two gay people were in a house and they had sex, then that was illegal. If, for instance, they had a lodger, say, um, and the gay blokes were in their bedroom and the lodger was in the lounge, it's still illegal because it was considered that... Um, you know, it's just not on it. You could be corrupting the other person. Even if the other person was a gay person, it was still illegal. You weren't allowed more than two people to um, be together in any sexual situation um, at any time. And even the definition of private was quite um, rigid, you know. I mean, private didn't include hidden away in the back of a woods or something, because that was in public ground, so that was... And they, the police used to pursue this sort of thing for years. Um, one of the things that was quite rife in those days was cottaging. I don't know if that's a term familiar to all of your listeners. But I believe it's what we call tea room. Okay, tea room. Yeah. Sex. Yeah. Uh, and that was quite rife, but it was very fraught, of course, because quite often the police would use agents provocateurs. Mm -hmm. um, and it was risky. Having said that, it was also quite fun. <laughs> it also meant I get kept detouring on the way to and from places all the time. <laughs> and if, I, if I'd had what I'd call a heterosexual evening, you know, like um, lots of um, mixed couples and straight friends and things, just ordinary social evenings, it was nice just to sort of do a quick detour into a cottage on the way home just to cheer myself up, you know. Because you can get a bit bored listening about family and, <laughs> and grandparents and things, you know, it does grind you down after a while. Which, of course, is something else that happens as you're gay and growing up. It, you start with the 
when are you going to get a girlfriend? So mm -hmm. like questions that go on for ages, apparently. Then it's, um, why haven't you got one yet? And then it's, when are you going to get married? And all this sort of thing, you know. I'm not saying it grinds you down, but it's, it's wearing over a long period of time. And all you really want to do is go and find some boyfriend and live the world with a boyfriend who might, if you're lucky, become a partner. Mm. Um, um, it's much the same. It's the same today, because even on lots of television shows like these um, little video outtakes that they do, um, they all go ooh and ah every time, say, a couple of toddlers kiss each other, you know, assuming it's a boy toddler and a girl toddler. Yeah. Yeah. They never actually show you two um, boys or girls kissing. But you see what I mean? It's the, it's the automatic concept that you're going to be a straight person and yeah. somewhat disappointment that you're not. So... But it was all right. Did you meet anyone interesting through these organizations? Oh, well, yes, sir. I, um, sorry, I didn't mean to smile too much there. It, <laughs> it was quite good. Um, no sooner had I got this contact, um, I found one miles from home, for, found two quite a long way. One was Hatfield and the other was over um, Chelmsford. So I went to the Chelmsford one first on the grounds that's further away for the same reasons, you know, don't want to meet anyone I know. Um, and that was quite nice, he was a very friendly chap and I get to meet one or two of the people in that group. Um, and then with the courage from that, I then contacted the Hatfield one, which was closer. Um, went off after work to see the, see the chap. I'd already, I knew where I was going to be because I'd already told me parents I might not be home tonight. <laughs> this was beforehand. I said, there's stuff going on at work, I might not, I might have to stop over. Um, in the event, I stopped over for two nights. Oh um, my. Said hello in a very friendly way to quite a few people. <laughs> and it was just wonderful. You know, um, I was really where I finally knew I wanted to be, you know, which was in sexy male company. That's what I really had always wanted from an early age. I just felt so happy then. And it was a, it was a, the groups were lovely because they had, sounds a bit twee now, but coffee evenings and oh. um, there was, they did sort of little subgroups like photographic club and I belonged to that, well start, I helped start that one um, and we used to do all our own printing and developing and things in those days. Um, so yeah, it was nice CHE, of course that sort of group has again these days pretty much died out because of the internet, yeah. everyone yeah. goes via internet and uh, as far as I can tell, a lot of them hardly ever get to see real people. They'd rather be yeah. on their computer and doing it like that. But it was nice and uh, yes, I met a lot of interesting people. <laughs> um, not just sexually interesting, but actually, you know, other reasons interesting as well. Like a diverse group of people, shall we say, with different interests and hobbies and so on. So that was good. In, in addition to the law about two gay people in, a, mm. in the same house, you yeah. alluded that there were other reasons that made meeting other gay people difficult. What other issues were there? Well, the other issues really were being able to identify people in any way. The only real way um, was to get to know where, um, where they hang, hang out, which... Eventually, having joined the CHE and talked to people there, I realised I didn't know about cottage until I joined CHE or, or, <laughs> or tea rooms, which is just as well because I'd never have passed my degree if I had. <laughs> <laughs> because there were, turns out there were two cottages in my hometown, you know. Uh, oh my I knew gosh. they were there, but I'd never thought of her hanging around in them for anybody. Um, oh my God. And it does sound sleazy, but it was great fun. So they told me that they were like outdoor cruising areas and things. And again, there were um, one or two not that too far away. They're still going as far as I know, um, but much cut back now. A lot of the cutbacks are the vegetation, of course, so you've got, oh. you've got nothing to hide behind anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there was one that was notorious at the time, it was called Scratchwood, which is just down the A1 off the A1M. And um, <laughs> uh, that was a, a lovely place. So every time I went into London for any reason, by car or back, then I'd often call on the way home, you know. Um, but that that's sort of 
turned not so good over recent years. By all accounts, there's been the anti-gay types who go along and beat people up and things. And I've never understood it. I've never wanted to beat anybody up in terms of what they are, you know, because I'm not really, a, I'm not a violent person. I was into SM and heavy SM, but that's not the same as violence. Correct. I mean, I've never been in a fight, for instance, in my life with anybody. Um, I can't understand the sort of, I don't know if it is hatred, I think it's just, if you like, peer pressure, look at us, what we can do, sort of rubbish, and they're just misinformed and yeah. misguided. But yes, that's that's the other thing I found out about um, open spaces and lay-bys, and I, it was all very exciting, I thought. Wow. Lorry drivers, that's another thing I always rather fancy. Ah! Was, um, you know, ah. lorry cab sex. I managed to find someone for that eventually. <laughs> that was rather good. I, I like the fact that if people knew, it would annoy them. <laughs> ah. You know. Um, and of course, from the heterosexual point of view, I understand it was actually a lot harder for them to do all these sorts of things. Um, I'd met my partner through um, one of the interest groups, which was a transport group. Um, I, I also met the, uh, a person that um, I ended up buying this house with um, after because we shared interests in classical music. Um, prior to meeting him, I'd already run classical music evenings when I was in um, student digs. There was four of us shared, four students shared a house, um, and I started classical music evenings there. And it was friends from work mainly, um, and that transferred to this house here, and that was going for well over twenty years. The only thing that really saw the ground a halt halt was um, age. They started dying off a bit, and then hmm. we, um, things like my troubles didn't help matters at all. Um, so it really sort of just ended naturally, I think, in the end. But that was a very good period as well, most enjoyable. When we were preparing for this interview, you said that religion dislikes us. What do you mean by that? Um, apart from mentioning the earlier bit about um, it was very, um, if you like, family orientation, the way it was presented. Um, uh, I don't mean just the Church of England, because that actually wasn't too bad, but as you grow up and listen to the media and um, so on, you hear about Catholic Church and so on. And oh, anything that's not like done with a wedded wife in the dark <laughs> is, uh, for procreation only is considered bad. And so therefore we were automatically bad because we weren't married, we weren't Catholic, yeah. and we just liked doing yeah. things. Um, and that still goes on. The media and the church as far as I see, have always been pretty much anti-gay. Um, the media and church still are in a lot of cases. I mean, today, on one of the news items, I saw that some um, archbishop in Greece or Cy um, Cy Cyprus or somewhere said that he found that homosexuality was caused by women having anal sex when they were pregnant. Oh, well, there. I mean, you know, I mean, what, what <laughs> better conclusion can you draw? And um, <laughs> apparently the sort of, a the urge for anus was, you know, built into the fetus. <laughs> and therefore he turned gay. <laughs> and that was on, that was on today. You know, you, <laughs> it's in there somewhere. And another one, that, another theory, because this is the other thing that annoys me a lot, I must admit, this is not just religion, but religion is holds a key part of it. I mean, the Muslim world in general, there was another survey the other day that I saw where um, the Muslim men, by and large, rated honour killing, you know, where they kill their wives or girlfriends or whatever if they stray, they rated that as a lower sin than homosexuality. Wow. So they considered us more dangerous and worse than them killing their relatives. And wow. that attitude's still there. And even now, these sort of Islamist world and thoughts is growing. So yeah. how long this sort of fairly safe world for us that we live in these days really will last, there's no yeah. way of knowing. So that's why I don't like religion. Um, 
I mean, there are other causes. They, they've never actually put forward a cause for being gay. They just don't like it, essentially. I know there are um, gay people within the church. That was the other big hypocrisy, of course. Sure. Is there were so many gay priests and um, clergy and so on. But they kept it all, if you like, under the carpet. Because they had to, because if they declared, and teachers and things. And um, that was... That was why I'm not very keen on religion.